Hello everyone, my name is Amy Souza and some of you may know me as Known Heretic from Twitter, uh, Instagram, or my YouTube channel as well as Facebook. So I have been wanting to bring you all some more material and this is uh, one of the things that I have been working on. So um, the overarching inquiry of this particular series is really to unravel unpack and track the thread of our direct experience. So I want to look at the why, how of this level of engagement, the level of engagement that is direct experience, and why this is crucial to our understanding of the politics around women and girls sex-based provisions. So uh, I'm going to cover five main areas, and they are as follows. Uh, one is nature versus culture. Two is value versus value neutral. Uh, three is mental concepts versus bodily precepts. Another way of saying this one is sense perception versus conceptualization. Uh, four is inclusivity versus boundedness. And five is embodiment versus dissociation. So, I'm going to break it down really clearly in order to uncover what is at work both on an experiential level and on the level of the cultural narrative. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of, um, I mean, both those things are at work at once, but I'm also kind of differentiating those two things. So in my analysis uh, that I'm going to cover in this uh, video is what is at work in the doctrine of uh, gender ideology slash identity. Um, and I'm going to just show and observe that this is a movement really that is about disembodiment, um, conceptual gaslighting, and ultimately it has an aim of boundary violation and dissociation. So that's, that's where we're headed. Okay, so first I'm going to talk about what I mean uh, when I'm talking about nature and what I mean when I'm talking about culture. So when I'm talking about nature, what I mean is discernible, sensible reality. Okay, the objects and beings in the world that the earth manifests as sensual presences to which we naturally respond. So when I say sensual here, <laughs> what I mean is sensible, you know, what we feel with our physical senses, what is physical, what is discernible, what is touchable, what is tangible with our human senses, what our senses can see and feel and respond to. So I'm... I'm talking, when I use this uh, way of talking about nature, um, I'm talking about the beings and the objects and the artifacts with which we interact on the physical material plane, okay? So I am I am talking about nature in the sense of um, what the earth provides, um, but I'm also talking about what is man-made. I am talking about what is... Um, what is available to be interacted with on the physical plane. So when I'm talking about culture, in this case, uh, I'm talking specifically about human culture, um, and I'm talking about um, how culture acts to make concepts for us about the existing material reality. So... Uh, for human beings and in human culture, language is how we communicate these concepts. So language is how we communicate the concepts of what already exists in the material plane. So if I want to talk about something that exists in the material plane, I have to use language. Um, some of the concepts uh, that language uh, provides for us refer directly back to material reality. So a flower, for example, can refer to a specific part of an organism with particular qualities. So if I'm talking about a flower, 
many images may come to your mind. Perhaps someone sees a peony, someone sees a tulip, someone sees a rose, maybe someone sees Monet's water lilies, or maybe you see, you know, the orange blossom pattern on your grandmother's china. Um, So the more specific the language we use, the closer we can get to describing the very specific organism that we're referring to, you know, maybe down to this particular, um, you know, honeysuckle that's that's kind of dying in, in water on my table. Um, so used this way, the language function of culture is helping you to be with the sense presence that um, that I'm attempting to describe. So language here is an attempt at a description of nature. Uh, and I just want to, I, I'm trying to break this down really clearly because I'm going to be talking about men and women. So uh, what I am talking about when I am talking about men and women is I am describing nature. I'm describing material reality and I am describing physical forms. I'm describing a kind of organism. Uh, And the scientific classification system of organisms is a way to neutrally describe different organisms with greater and greater specificity according to their form and functions. So this way of classifying um, describes how or or bodies are organized. It describes how bodies are organized and how those organization organisms uh, function. So when I'm talking about a man, <laughs> I'm talking about an animal. Okay, uh, animals have qualities like digesting food internally. They're mobile. I'm not talking about a fungus. Okay, funguses uh, digest food externally and they're non mobile. Uh, when I'm talking about a man, I'm talking about a mammal. Okay, mammals have qualities that they have fur, they breathe with lungs. Okay, I'm not talking about a fish. Okay, fish have scales and they breathe with gills. Uh, when I'm talking about a man, I'm talking about a primate. Okay, primates have collarbones and grasping fingers. I'm not talking about rodents that have continuously growing incisors. Uh, when I'm talking about a man, I'm talking about a human. Um, humans are bipedal. Um, I am not talking about monkeys who have tails. Uh, and when I'm talking about men, um, <laughs> I am talking about an adult human who has a body organized around small mobile gametes. I am not talking about women who have bodies organized around immobile, large immobile gamete production. Okay. So I'm just laying this out really clearly and slowly in order to make clear that these uh, language concepts refer directly back to material reality. They refer directly back to bodies and body organization and function. And in this sense, uh, they are neutral descriptions of what exists on the material plane. So um, the words that describe these physical characteristics are concepts, but the qualities that they describe are experienced holistically, and they exist despite the language that we use to describe them. Um, Beings are felt, experienced, and lived by other beings, okay? Um, I'm not using the words man and women to talk about the social roles that are sometimes associated with the sexes, and nor am I using these words to talk about some sort of identity status. I'm using the words to describe physical material reality. Okay, so uh, of course I'm, I'm building towards an argument uh, that is going to aim to protect these words as words that describe material reality, but my my deeper point in this moment is that Regardless of the words that we use to describe material reality, material reality continues to exist, okay? Human sexual reproduction will continue to exist even if we bastardize the words man-woman from their sexual functions into identity categories, okay? Um, 
And further, regardless of the scientific concepts that we use to describe physical categories, our spontaneous experience will still respond instinctually and holistically to physical beings, okay? So uh, whatever word, for example, we use to describe the physical being we now call a rattlesnake, okay? Whatever words we use to describe that snake, my embodied response to hearing that very distinctive rattle will still be the same. Okay, calling a rattlesnake a baby bunny will not hinder my instincts from kicking in in response to that rattle. Okay, so again, this is all to say that when I use these words, I'm using them to describe nature, physical forms, a way of saying how things are organized by their shape, qualities, functions, and how they are experienced in direct bodily perception. Okay. All right. So to wrap up that last little bit, that was talking about nature and culture, nature being um, material reality as it exists and is available to our sense perceptions and culture, uh, which is the social agent, which gives language and voice uh, to that which exists. So I, I want to, um, and I just want to say that, uh, I, I want to further say really quickly that naming the physical qualities of things is not an opinion. Uh, it's an observation of material reality. So when I say that a man is a man or a woman is a woman, I'm observing um, the physical form and function of these kind of beings. I'm not projecting my opinion about them. I'm not projecting a value onto them. Uh, I am simply observing material reality. So uh, now I want to move into talking about value versus value neutral. Uh, so uh, material reality, that which exists in the natural world uh, created by nature, is value neutral. Okay, uh, a cedar, a peony, a, a mushroom, a crab, a stag, a fox, all of these things are value neutral, meaning that they are, they are neither positive nor negative. Um, that which the earth makes and draws forth um, is value neutral, and it's culture that gives these things value. Um, so cultural values can sometimes be benign, uh, like knowing that a plant is edible versus non-edible, um, you know, or we can give things monetary value, like cedar is 99 cents a pound and uh, gold is $300 a gram. Uh, or values can be even more abstract, such as special identities, um, and that these identities deserve to be respected by the surrounding culture. So that, that's, a, that's a really abstract value because it no longer applies to a material form. Um, it applies to a concept um, and values a concept. So each of these values is more and more abstract and less and less benign, okay? Um, um, even to give things a monetary value that that ceases to be benign um, because that that affects uh, you know the amount of resources there are what we um, how how many hours we have to labor in order to acquire those resources so um, these more and more specific um, uh, values can sometimes get less and less benign so regardless of the cultural value that are placed on things at the level of nature, things still exist in their material form and are experienced on the physical level in a value neutral way, despite the cultural value. So, um, you know, regardless of the cost of cedar or the cost of gold, I, it doesn't matter. It doesn't um, change how I physically experience those items um, or those beings. 
Uh, so we could say at one time oranges were sought after or gold was sought after or tulips, you know, at one time were even sought after and, and it became the value by which the surrounding things around it were measured. Um, but again, the cultural value placed on these items does not change our direct experience of them. Uh, so basically here, what I'm, what I'm building towards is observing that the language and tactics used by the gender industry um, are not neutral. Okay, so they, they have a lot of tactics that they use, and I'm sure that you've seen them, and these tactics are not benign. They are not neutral. I want to talk about... Um, we've talked about nature, uh, we've talked about value, nature versus culture, value versus value neutral, uh, and now I want to move into inclusivity versus boundedness, okay? And so one of the key tactics that the gender industry is using right now is this value, um, cultural value of inclusivity okay and they're doing things like uh, saying that we need to refer to women as menstruators cervix havers um, vulva owners we need to refer to mothers as chest feeders and um, birthing bodies and gestational parents and they're using this language under the guise of the value of inclusivity. Uh, so my argument here is that the value of inclusivity is, first of all, not benign. Um, it has a direct impact on the lived experience of women and girls. And further, um, that this overprivileging of the value of inclusivity comes at the expense of the value of boundaries and boundedness, okay? So what is inclusivity? Okay, let's let's just look at the literal definitions. Okay, so to include something is to contain something as part of something else. Um, to be inclusive um, is to cover or having intended to cover all items. Okay, now... Uh, including is a great thing to do oftentimes, okay? So, um, you know, including all the kids in your class at your birthday party, that's a really nice thing to do. Um, but the value of inclusivity is not always useful to every situation. Um, if I am baking a cake, uh, I only want to include so much salt. I do not want to be inclusive of all of the salt in my pantry or that will be a very bad cake. The cake will no longer be what a cake is. <laughs> it will be something else. Um, I, I want to, uh, observe also, uh, that our understanding of the concept of inclusivity is only possible because we live in a bounded universe. Okay. So I want to observe here that every single thing in the universe is is bounded, okay? That's that's the nature of living in a material universe. All things have matter. Matter vibrates at different frequencies and gives things mass, okay? Everything is uniquely bounded and this is what makes different things different. It's what makes cups cups and water water and it's why cups can hold water uh, because of their unique kinds of boundedness. Everything down to the electron of the atom is bounded, okay? And we experience things through their boundedness. It's what gives things physicality. Um, it, it, it makes us able to have a different and unique physical experience of the water versus the cup, okay? So 
we have this this um, industry, this this gendering industry, has overvalued uh, this idea of inclusivity, but it comes at the expense of the value of boundedness or boundaries. Um, a boundary fixes a limit; it separates things, um, and boundaries are necessary for the physical safety of women and girls are are we we fought for these spaces and sports our shelters our our domestic violence shelters our rape crisis centers our single sex prisons our single sex spaces like locker rooms and bathrooms we fought for these in order to put boundaries around our bodies and this notion that these spaces be inclusive of everyone um comes at the expense of our boundaries. Okay, so you're about 20 or so minutes in with me right now. Uh, The concepts that we've covered so far are nature versus culture, uh, talking about material reality and how we describe material reality. Uh, We have also talked about value uh, versus value neutral uh, um, and talked about uh, how we interact with things in our direct perception is value neutral and it is culture that gives things values. Uh, And we've also talked about um, inclusivity and boundedness, okay? And we've talked about how um, the way that inclusivity is being used by culture right now is not benign uh, to the direct experience of women and girls. So here's where we are going to start getting into some really juicy stuff. Okay. This, this is getting into kind of my, my favorite part of talking about what I want to talk about. So first I want to talk about sense perception versus, uh, conceptualization. So this is mental concepts versus bodily precepts. Okay. And, uh, so we, I've talked about, um, at the level of, um, at the level of nature. Okay. At the level of nature, that's, that's where we are dealing with bodily precepts. That's where we're dealing with sense perceptions, sense perception. That is the level of nature that is at work. Okay. Um, and for those of you who are curious, <laughs> um, my, my, my my background of this, my my studying in this is of phenomenology, and specifically, if you want to look a little bit more into it, um, you can look at Merleau Ponty. Um, you can look a little bit at Heidegger and a little bit at Husserl. Um, Merleau Ponty is my favorite. Who who speaks about this? What I'm talking about is. Um, this is described by the philosophy of phenomenology, okay? And phenomenology is the world as it is experienced in its felt immediacy, okay? This is the world of intuition, instinct, immediacy, and reaction, okay? So if you want to look at this a little bit deeper, you can study that field, or you can just listen to this because I have already um, grappled with the concepts for you. (laughs) Um, Phenomenology, the world as it is experienced in its felt immediacy. This is to say (laughs) we are always experiencing the world through our sense perceptions first, okay? We are always situated in our bodies, okay? There is, as much as we adore our concepts, we are in our bodies first. Our concepts about the world are secondary to our lived experience. Our first response to the world is sensed, felt, and perceived, okay? Um, so, okay, so we're, I'm going to just go really slowly th- with this. So 
we, Descartes uh, talked about, you know, man as a machine. He talked about, I think, therefore I am. And Merleau-Ponty, in talking about phenomenology, says that our body is not an object for an I think. <laughs> it is a grouping of lived through meanings. Okay, so this is to say that our body is not a mind. It's not an ego. It's not a conceptualizing mechanism. Okay, our bodies find meaning through experience, through feeling, through perceiving, holistically all at once, okay? Our body is its own field of awareness, knowledge formation, meaning formation, and all of this is happening precognitively. Okay? Um, the body is the location of our awareness, okay? Um, we we sense the world first with our bodies. Um, and this is precognitive. This, this sense awareness, our instincts, our intuition are happening at a level um, pre-conceptual thought, okay? So, you know, if you touch a hot pan, your hand is going to immediately recoil from the hot pan. You don't have to think, um, you don't have to conceptualize this pan is hot. I should remove my hand, your body simply responds instinctually um, without your conscious willing of it, without your conscious awareness of it. So our entire field of experience is mediated by our body. Our spontaneous lived experience is primary. Um, and our spontaneous lived experience is pre-conceptual, okay? Um, it's not a matter of our conscious willing. It's not a matter of our concepts. Um, we don't have to, um, e even without concepts for things, we we experience them in, in the physical plane and our body naturally responds to those things. So for example, okay, if I sense a man in my space, okay, I don't know if he is a, a non-conforming man, uh, B, a man claiming a special identity status, or C, a man who is like the wolf in Little Red Riding Hood who is trying to use deceit specifically to violate my boundaries. So, as I sense this man in my space, I'm not reacting to the concept of a man. Um, I'm not trying to grapple with all of these different scenarios. Is he a nonconforming man? Is he a man with a special identity? Is he is he a boundary man? I, I'm simply reacting um, as an adult human female to an adult human male in my space. Um, these concepts, these different identities men can claim, it has nothing to do with my spontaneous reaction. And, and that spontaneous reaction that I'm having is honed by millions of years of instinct, okay? And it's understood by every female animal species, okay? Uh, a man that is holding a special identity is a concept that makes absolutely no difference to my embodied response and instincts, okay? Uh, the experience is prior to my thoughts about the experience. My body responds in a way that precedes any mental analysis that I have to do about the situation. I'm simply going to be responding to this man in my space. I don't I don't know what his identity claims are, but I'm already reacting. Um, reality engages us before our analyzing theories, okay? So when I'm reacting to that man in my space, my body is responding before I can mentally analyze who he is. I sense him and I react based on my instincts and intuitions. I'm not in a state of mentally thinking about gender ideology categorization. I'm not thinking about abstract concepts like identity theory, okay? And this level of participation and sense sense perception is already there, okay? It's there before we reflect or philosophize. Our lived reaction 
has already been experienced. Even if I start to philosophize, even if I start to analyze this 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 experience, my 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 lived experience already happened. My sense perceptions have already happened. Even if I attempt to begin to philosophize around it, and the meaning of the experience has already been lived. Regardless if I come to some sort of analysis that this is a man holding a special identity, um, I already responded to him like a man. I, 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 it doesn't matter what he claims to be. It doesn't matter if he claims, you know, quote, uh, he is woman identity. I already responded to the man in my space, okay? It, it, my, that that already happened. That meaning has already been assimilated by my body. It doesn't matter what theories my mind comes up with. Um, that truth has already been lived within me, okay? And so... Um, so to hold women and girls, first of all, accountable uh, for our lived responses is to shame us. It's shaming us for our preconceptual lived spontaneous responses. This is abuse. This is absolutely abusive to women and girls. It, it is, it's not only gaslighting of the worst kind. It, it's a form of, of coercion, of undue influence. It's a form of thought control. Um, it, it's trying to um, it's trying to one deny that we have uh, uh, that we have awarenesses at the level of physical responses, um, and it's trying to it's an attempt to get us to dissociate from our bodies, dissociate from our instinct, dissociate from our intuition. It's causing a cognitive dissonance. It asks us to repress and ignore our embodied responses. It's it's a it's an absolute subversion of our sensed um, direct experiences. Um, so, you know, any any ideology that asks me or any woman and girl to dissociate from my own experience, I say no. Uh, and if you're asking me to preach or endorse any ideology that asks women and girls to dissociate from their lived spontaneous experience, I say no. Uh, um, and further, if you're asking me to cut myself off from the holistic language that describes my physical sensory experiencing, um, again, the answer is no. Okay. All right. So we're, we're getting into our wrap up. Um, and you can already, you can really already see where I was going with the sense perception versus conceptualization. Um, and ultimately, uh, this is getting us into a place of embodiment versus dissociation. Okay, so I I think I said uh, earlier that you know our body is not an object for an I think it's a grouping of lived through meanings. Okay, our body is not a functional machine that elicits an appropriate reaction to an environmental stimulus. Um, <laughs> our body um, is is constantly responding to the stimulus around it. We are always in our bodies. Okay, embodiment is the essential element of human existence. It is our holistic integrity with ourselves. And here's the thing, I am always in my body, okay? Always. I am always situated in my body. I am never not in my body, okay? I'm always in my body. I'm never not in my body, okay? A man is always in his body. He is never not in his body, okay? Whatever a man chooses to do to his body, whether a man chooses to take hormones, whether a man chooses to uh, have his penis inverted or cut his balls off, a man is always situated in his body. Those are experiences unique to a male body. Those are not experiences that a woman can have. I can never have those experiences. I can never cut off my penis or invert my penis or cut off my balls. Those are uniquely male experiences that 
are still a man being situated in his own body. So there is no way, first of all, for a man to understand the lived integrity of existing in a female body. There is no man that will ever have one single solitary female experience uh, because we are embodied beings. We Women are whole human beings, fully embodied in our bodies, okay? We are not a concept. We are not an idea. Um, and we're not an identity. We are a kind of being, um, a kind of organism with a specific kind of organization and function. Uh, we're not a, we're not some sort of um, disembodied transcendental ego. The body is the true subject of experience. All of my experiences are happening to my body. I am my body, okay? Um, we wouldn't have anything to think about, reflect about, um, or, or conceptualize around without our sensory experience, okay? Without our sensory experiences, our physical, tangible, touchable, tasteable, feelable experiences, there would be nothing to think about or question or know, okay? Think about that. Our sensory experiences are primary. The sensory world is primary, okay? There's nothing to conceptualize about without a sensory physical world in which we are situated and embodied. Okay, the living body <laughs> is the very possibility of contact, reflection, thought, and knowledge, okay? Our body is a site of knowledge formation, meaning making, experiencing, okay? At the heart of even our most, our very most abstract thoughts, our sensuous living body is experiencing the world, okay? The experience, the experiencing self is the body, okay? My myself is my body. Myself is not separated from my body. I am my body, okay? So this is true. This this is very physically, tangibly true. But what is happening in the ideology um, around this uh, gender activism is the objectifying and the dissociation of the body. Okay. So the the objectified body is the body that we we imagine in our head. It's the conceptualized body. You know, we've we've um, this 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 ideology conceptualizes um, the idea of of man and woman from a physical form into a concept, into an idea, into um, you know something that is divorced from physical reality. But always underneath this conceiving body, this conceptualizing body, is our perceiving body, okay? The body as it actually experiences things. And the body as it actually experiences things is prior to all concepts, okay? The body initiates everything. It suffers everything. The body feels everything. Um, and that is really what I am giving voice to. I'm giving voice to the direct experience of women and girls' situation within this ideology. So we are are here um, suffering these concepts that culture is throwing at us, this idea that that um, our lived embodied experience is, first of all, um, a concept, is second of all, not inclusive somehow, that we don't deserve boundaries around our bodies. Um, and that we are told that we should dissociate from our direct experience. Um, th this whole ideology is asking us to dissociate from what is lived and go into a concept that, first of all, um, has is is unrelated to our direct experience. This concept of 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 you know, a man being a woman identity, that, that is absolutely unrelated to the lived experience of existing in a female body. But not only is it unrelated, it's a dissociation from women's actual embodiment, okay? So 
I am here trying to give value and give voice to women and girls' bodily awareness, our bodily intelligence, our bodily reactions, okay? Our body is always aware. Our body is a site of spontaneous awareness, constantly adapting to the world around it without even our conscious awareness of of the actual environment. You know, I'm 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 doing these minute gestures. I'm I'm sort of adjusting in my chair. I'm I'm brushing my hair aside. It's these are not um, conscious thoughts that I'm having uh, to make myself do these things. This is my body responding receptively, spontaneously, creatively to the distinct situated environment. Um, And this is, you know, ultimately what I'm arguing for is an integrity around women and girls' bodies, the integrity of our lived experience, the holistic nature of that lived experience. Um, All right. So we're... We're pretty far in and and I want to I want to kind of wrap this up a little bit. So we we've, we've talked about nature versus culture, we've talked about values versus value neutral, um we've talked about sense perception versus conceptualization, um inclusivity versus boundedness and embodiment versus dissociation. Um and you know, these are the these are all they're they're the layers that I've wanted to bring us through to really ground us um in our lived experience and and really I want to empower women and girls to claim claim our situatedness in our bodies, claim our lived experience, claim our direct sensory perceptions, um, and, and to really, um, resist, resist being shamed, um, for not conceptualizing our experience first, um, to really, um, privilege our, our wholeness, our integrity, um, you know, I, I've said elsewhere and I, I just want to repeat now, <laughs> it is, it, it's just absolute insanity. It, it's insanity to act as if our bodies are these inanimate sleeves, um, that hold no meaning for us, that, that our bodies have nothing to do with our direct experience. Okay. Our bodies are how we sense, perceive, and interact with the world around us. Okay. My body is how I engage with the world. It is how I make meaning out of experiences through the specific site and location of my body, which I am always in. The cult, and I do call it a cult, the cult of gender ideology preaches dissociation. But we are all fully embodied, whole human beings. Our body is not just a part of our humanity. Our bodies are our humanity. Okay. And all it takes is the simple act of observation to see that having a different sex body influences experience differently. Okay. That is a neutral observation. Okay. It's, it's as neutral as saying, um, you know, birds have wings and that is a different experience than being a bipedal organism organism. These different experiences are different and they are going to create different meanings in the world. Okay. It's a neutral observation, but it is also a meaningful observation to say that different sexed bodies are different. Women are, you know, constantly engaged with our physical bodies. Okay. Whether it is, um, you know, getting your period, not getting your period and having to grapple with that, um, going through menopause, going through early onset menopause, having, uh, getting pregnant, giving birth, having an abortion. Um, we go through these monthly cycles. We are constantly engaging with our bodies at different levels. I mean, we, women, you know, many of us literally track our cycle every day. We are giving constant attention to the femaleness of our bodies and we have to navigate our life around it, you know? (laughs) 
well, I won't get into that. Um, we have to navigate our life around it. So anyway, our bodies carry our experiences. They help us make meaning out of those experiences. And the act of dissociation it, 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 um, you know, it, it, it doesn't just take us out of our bodies, which is what it does, but it keeps us from having valuable insights, intuition, and wisdom. It keeps us, um, from being able to be fully responsive. Okay. If I'm dissociated from my body, um, I, I can no longer be in spontaneous participation with my environment. Okay. If I'm trying to conceptualize my environment, I'm not responding to my instincts. Okay. So, you know, the <laughs> so really, I, you know, the safety of women and girls, the integrity of women and girls um, and children, you know, and all children depends on our ability to be responsive to our bodies, to our, to the site and location of meaning, to be able to rely on our instincts, to accurately identify sex quickly. Okay. This is from millions of years of honed instincts. Okay. We, we are still a species that reproduces sexually. That will always be how we arrive on this planet, you know? This is part of of any animal that reproduces sexually. You will respond to the opposite sex. You will have a response. Um so so to 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 get women and children to dissociate from those intuitions, to dissociate from those sense perceptions, to dissociate from those instincts that are honed over millions and millions of years, that is abuse. That is gaslighting. Um, that is is absolutely a direct harm to women, girls, and all children. Okay, um, we need to be protecting women from this cognitive dissonance. Okay, and that's why I've said in in many other places that we must stop participating in this gender jargon. Okay, you, you gotta stop. You 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 gotta say men are men, women are women, boys are boys, girls are girls talk about material reality, stop using their jargon, stop using their words. If you must use it, use it in quotes, um, but stop it, you know, stop using it. We, we need to, um, we need to stand up in defense of our boundaries. Okay. We need to stand up in defense of our sense perceptions. We need to stand up, um, in, in defense of, nature and neutral language around describing nature. And that that is my hope uh, for all of us is that we can do this in order to protect women and girls, um, in order to protect children from dangerous grooming, and in order to, you know, really re... Um, re- basically remember, remember the values of embodiment. Okay. That is a value. Remember that value. Remember the value of boundaries. That is a value. So don't let this ideology, um, disrupt you with its concepts and disrupt you with its jargon and its cognitive dissonance and its dissociation. Um, we are fully embodied whole human beings. And our sense perceptions are our direct experience, okay? Our sense perceptions are prior to our concepts and our instincts and situatedness have already shown us that our boundaries are valuable, okay? They're more valuable than including men and boys in our spaces and sports. And we need to protect women and girls by remembering that. Thank you.